All right, ladies and gentlemen, if you would please take your seats, we'll begin our program. Uh, welcome, uh, good afternoon to everyone who is just joining us, faculty. We have a great program this afternoon. Um, I wanted to draw your attention to the slide here uh, with the panels. Just one moment. Um, we have two successive panels. We have one in Pringle and one in Spruance. And uh, for the remainder of the of the afternoon and tomorrow's program, we'll also have two panels as well. Uh, so our afternoon panel is faculty development with our moderator, Dr. Heidi Lane. And Dr. Heidi Lane is a professor of strategy and policy and the director of the Greater Middle East Research Study Group at the Naval War College. She is co-editor of Building Rule of Law in the Arab World and Beyond, and is completing a book titled The Counter-Terrorist State about counterterrorism policies and practices in the Middle East. Welcome, Dr. Lane, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, um, before, first of all, thank you for coming and uh, welcome to the afternoon sessions. The first thing that I wanna say is just a couple points of order uh, because we're, I, I was actually not gonna read your bios even though you kindly introduced me uh, because we wanna make sure we have maximum amount of time for questions and answers. Um, so in, in so doing, we're gonna, uh, the first person that's going to be presenting is Dr. Mary Raum. After she speaks for about 25 minutes, we're gonna take a moment and have Q and A uh, for about 10 to 15 then, and then we're going to proceed with uh, Professor Stokes and uh, 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 Curtis. Sorry, not Curtis. Bell. Professor Bell. So we'll have two separate sections. Um, I also want to emphasize for anybody who either wasn't here earlier or who is rejoining that this is an open session. That means it's unrestricted access to those who are watching from outside. So I don't want to discourage you from introducing yourself with your uh, with your name and affiliation, but just so you know, that is going out on the airwaves and can't be edited out of a final version. And uh, the last thing I'll do is remind everyone to use the microphone when you do ask the question and answer. Okay, so uh, before uh, Professor Round begins her presentation, I want to say two things. One of them is that if you went to the morning sessions and you heard the provost speak and the admiral this morning, um, there are so many things that are uh, hopeful missions in the future that pertain to women, peace and security and also by, uh, by extension to DEI. However, most of them are very, very difficult to implement. And the three panelists that you're going to hear this afternoon are people who are in the process of doing the hard work of implementing this stuff and then reporting back on it. And this is where really the rubber meets the road, in my opinion, because there is really there is almost no institution that likes to have change imposed or presented in a way that uh, forces everyone to comply. And so all of the human elements, all of the procedural issues, all of the bureaucratic uh, mechanisms that need to be changed happen uh, through the people that are presenting here. So I want to commend that work because it's very hard and it's very often not uh, appreciated in the way that it should be. So with that, let me turn it over to Professor Realm uh, and you have the floor. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Lane. Um, so good afternoon. I see we have some distinguished guests in the audience, admirals, um, other distinguished guests, students and faculty. Um, and thank you, Heidi, uh, for the opportunity and Dr. Yamin for the opportunity to present some ideas on educational strategies for security studies on sexual assault and sexual harassment. I'm Mary Rahm, a professor in the National Security Affairs Department here at the Naval War College. Uh, before getting started, there's, yep, there's a disclaimer. Um, all these ideas are mine alone and do not represent the Department of Descents or any other allied entities um, in DOD. So I need to 
put you in uh, touch with where I'm speaking from today. It's right here in the public policy analysis program within the National Security Affairs Department. So it's it's very limited, but some of the ideas are also broad enough, I think, that other folks uh, may be able to use them. So how come this topic is important and relevant in today's National Security Studies program? Because within this umbrella are assessments of ethical, legal, and political implications of national security decision making. And in order to maintain program viability, the application of theories and techniques learned by the security sector professional must include current issues in the field. To this end, the inclusion of material about sexual assault and sexual harassment becomes an imperative due to its applicability to the security sector culture, the role Congress plays in oversight of the military, and the military's policy role as a steward of its people. What is the current situation that has led to a congressional intervention regarding sexual assault and sexual harassment? First is the military struggle to rectify the situation by processitizing their efforts. These labors include laying out new institutional entities, developing required training programs and policies, and the creation of outputs-based metrics. Example, on the military side of DOD, is proclaiming a zero tolerance policy, opening up call lines, creating the primarily rules-based SHARP sexual assault response prevention program, establishing the sexual assault prevention and response office or SAPRO for the oversight of policy and standards. These are important strategies in their ability to establish red lines. Such programs get at the how to control and contain, but do not address the why of what is a festering cultural problem. Legendary management guru Peter F. Drucker, after observing thousands of organizations in his lifetime, once stated that culture, no matter how defined, is the singularly persistent influence in all organizations. So this thought has been modified over the years to become culture eats strategy for lunch. And it is in this essence that is what is occurring relative to the military's addressing of these problems today. An effort was made to enculturate the idea that sexual harassment and assault are not tolerable, but the sense of this 2012-2015 ad campaign across the services completely missed the mark for its bias toward the female role as victim and the male in charge of the female state. Added to this was that sexual assault and rape occur because of alcoholic consumption and in general within the sphere of party or bar. The campaign brings to mind the late 1950s and early 1960s glamorized smoky world of advertising in the Mad Men TV drama series. Because the campaign met with resistance, it was pulled to be replaced by two video game training scenarios. The first showing service members watching a colleague getting too forward with a woman at a bar. A male voice over exclaims, man, that's all we need is to get put on lockdown again before getting up to intervene. In another scenario is a bar scene with loud music, cold beer, and what are described as hot girls with a narrator commentary of players of the video must choose whether to stop certain behaviors. If the viewer fails the game, a female in the military gets raped in a barracks, reports the assault, and leaves the service. My four-word exclamation, what nonsense is this? So let's move on to the real world. Um, pursuit of congressional oversight of the situation has been ongoing for nearly two decades without gaining enough support to shift the thinking of how the military should be managing this egregious cultural phenomenon. In general, an organizational culture shift, which is required here, nearly never occurs unless there is a situation so intolerable that it wakes up and activates in today's vernacular a hashtag I am response. The flashpoint for congressional movement into bipartisan efforts to alleviate and not continue to placate the current vicious cycle of internal legal and command processes and training came to a head with the brutally sadistic death of PSC Vanessa Guillen in April of 2020 on Fort Hood. And I put this um, video in here to remind you there's a really good Netflix uh, series that actually uh, goes through this entire process. It's a, it's a very good, um, very good series. So earlier data showed that one in 24 female service members and one in 100 male service members or 1% can expect to experience sexual trauma or assault 
at some point in their career. And in total, that comes to an estimated 20,000 people each year. In fiscal year 2021, these numbers were updated to 16% of male service members reporting sexual assault and 33% of female service members. In the U.S. Navy, 2021 reports cited 12% of male sailors reporting sexual assault and 28% of female sailors reporting. The difficulties with changing a large bureaucratic culture are that the cycle of change invariably takes about two, two generations. And for a legislative censuring of the military to be put on the books and activated, as well as shifts in the formalities of the organization, organization, such as reporting mechanisms and command responsibilities and changes in overall demographics, has already been formally pursued for almost 15 years. In this case, demographics specifically has been notable in driving change because over the past two decades, Congress has shifted in its demeanor relative to female representatives, which now hold 144 of 539 seats. It is from among key congressional women, such as Kirsten Gillibrand, Democrat of New York, that the fight for the military justice improvement and increasing prevention act emerged. Jackie Speer, Democrat, California, along with Republican Michael Turner of Ohio, introduced the Vanessa Guillen Act to remove sexual assault prosecution decisions from the chain of command. One of the complications with changing the culture of a massive military system or any other large bureaucratic system for that matter is that the change rarely comes from within its ranks. An outside dynamic is nearly always required because of the generational belief quagmires of both Congress and the military, which can impede change. Also complicating the rate of change is the time factor inherent to congressional processes. Senator Gillibrand has been working on legislation since the early 2000s. And while the Military Justice Reform Act is on the books, there is still work to be achieved regarding who legally represents victims during a courts martial, the role the command chain will play when a victim comes forward, and whether additional crimes should be added to the list. So how do you teach one of the most significant military and security sector workplace reforms in American history? Where should a unit or units regarding the themes, subject matter, and issues inherent to sexual harassment and assault reside? Because here at the War College, the NSA department teaches graduate level security studies and emphasizes policy analysis as one of its two core realms and the high degree to which themes of congressional oversight civilian military relationships, and the roles of the White House, Secretary of Defense, and the Department of Defense Joint Chiefs, having had direct ties to the issue, studies fit very well with into, into this programmatic system. But before embarking on the curriculum creation adventure, a few do's and don'ts should be understood. There needs to be an alleviation of any misnomer or innuendo which categorizes males as key to the situation. Sexual assault and harassment are inclusive of the entire military culture. Care should be given as to where a case or discussion is placed and what should be the title. The use of only quantitative learning materials due to comfort with discussion behind numbers does not get at the importance of the elements of the cultural and socio-emotional aspects of the problems associated with sexual harassment and assault. It's important to not attempt to treat the topic as a fad and jam it into existing studies to get it out there. This weakens its importance. And a jamming approach is disingenuous and does not attach long-term value to the topic's inclusion. And professional students know when they are being hustled rather than being taught. I will now address a few of these items in greater detail by using the current study module, somewhat of the current study module in the FPA um, curriculum here. The first thing, key is to professionalize the topic. So what might be required for, for doing this in a curriculum? Time should be used to contemplate the differences between a sapper approach to the subject and a public policy approach to the subject. Realize there are important building blocks that are necessary for creating a lasting curriculum and be creative with your curriculum tools. This is the 21st century. Videos, testimony, and film are a must have especially in light of the currency and unfolding nature of the legislative situation surrounding sexual harassment and assault. 
Students very often want to gravitate toward tactical level sapper storytelling time. Yes, these inputs aid in understanding the military culture. However, faculty are not counselors, nor do they have direct knowledge of the events of the situations being described from the field. I would like to delve a bit deeper into curriculum materials, placement of subject matter, and pedagogy next. So what the faculty need to know in order to teach a unit that highlights the legislation of sexual assault and harassment. The presentation in a policy realm should, again, not be a SAPR discussion. That's first. Faculty are not experts in the field, nor should they be required to be. And faculty are not advocates or interventionists. There are specific training modules and training personnel that address SAPR de definitions, guidelines, rules, and regulations. So what are some of the key building blocks for a policy level discussion? There, right there, you see the Congress and the military dyad. And then I'm gonna go over some of these. Of course, buy-in for a successful program requires support from the top down. As always, check the current educational requirements being handed down from the CNO's office or other educational hierarchies at the institutional level as guides for insertion. Of equal importance is feedback from the civilian and military professional student body once a curriculum rolls out, since these are the individuals who are working in the realities of this cultural concern. Collaboration with knowledgeable personnel who have written and studied on this subject matter from outside the organization should be considered before putting a curriculum play in motion. This allows room for the faculty to become the integrator of the subject in discussion rather than act as an advocate in an area with which they likely may not have an existential level of knowledge. Sexual harassment and assault are culturally, emotionally, and physically based concerns. Content should hit three and not two amphitheaters. These I call the cultural congressional military triad. There is such a thing as cultural policy, and these policies may be of three types, rule shifting, culture shifting, or a combination of both. In this instance, a combination of rule shifting is found in the form of where the power and oversight of adjudicating sexual harassment and sexual assault cases will reside inside or outside the military chain of command. There's also cultural shifting, which is encountering new ways of doing things that challenge the basic belief structures currently embedded in the military. No policy discussion on sexual harassment and assault should be without some form of information that addresses both the rule of law and culture. So this is a summary slide. Um, can go back and look at these later if you want to. That's why I put those in there. Um, and what I'd like to go into next are um, what are some of the questions that should be asked in a curriculum? So my uh, experiences in the world of education have made me come to believe pedagogy. My methods of teaching are grounded in the question set proposed in the syllabus. So I think they're pretty important. Um, and here are, let me make sure this is the right slide. Yeah. Here are um, some of the best questions out of the current syllabus, which cover the Congress culture military triad. And wrapped within these are the cultural aspect of shaping two why queries and a what query, which primarily probes the role of Congress and change. So what could be what could make some of this a little better? Um, you know, what's missing? Here are some potential questions that would expand discussion pastures beyond legislative function and process. Included are congressional mandates for intervention, asking about challenges between specific committees and identifying key legislators who are behind the new ideas, both those that support and those that do not support the situation. Discussions of specific policies, policies directly applicable to sexual harassment and assault should also be included. And there are many of them. 10 of importance have rolled out between 2004 and 2019 and include sec def directives, panel reviews, general task forces, defense advisory committees, and investigative task forces. So readings also guide classroom pedagogy. And do the readings address the military cultural Congress triad in a meaningful way? These are, these are my personal opinions. They are not Naval War College opinions. These are my personal opinions as an instructor of many years. Um, the red just gets too bogged down in functionality at the price of stepping away 
from the specific and unique nature of Senator Gillibrand's bipartisan legislation. Curriculum up to this point has addressed how Congress works. So the Oxford Handbook piece is redundant in many ways, with the exception of the excellent presentation of internal and external factors, which influence congressional action. The chapter from Managing Sex in the U.S. Military, I read the entire volume for a book review for the Army War College, is primarily only useful for its short forays into some of the historical flashpoints over time. Um, it also introduces um, the U.S. Navy tailhook scandal, which brings up another point. There should be specific ties made to the U.S. Navy um, within the illustrations and policies somewhere in the reading. So that's a, a positive for that. So secondly, um, the chapter itself leans toward the sapper jargon, which I have kind of an affinity against rather than policy jargon. And then there are some, of course, excellent readings. Um, there are pieces that mesh well into this triad. And the correspondence records of the viewpoints of top military professionals are vital reading as these letters, while politically derived, give a nod to the bleach structures of the upper echelons of the U.S. military on sexual harassment and assault. And then somewhere in the middle is a reader. It's an absolutely an excellent resource to have these with a curriculum so that students can adventure into, you know, further adventure into the subject matter when they have an interest. And I found there's a very high interest in this subject. Um, the question here is, you know, we have to look at are the are the materials outdated or the or do the items chosen tend almost always toward the functional um, and where are the cultural aspects of the issue should be considered. Now, another area that I think is really imperative in in um, in creating curriculum is to know something about the. This isn't the only time in history that Congress has intervened to socially shift military culture. Um, and I think it's important to know a few of these. And I put up this um, pictorial montage to, to hit a highlight, a few of these, to know that these also exist. They're really good bases for discussion in the classroom, um, you know, to note that why Congress is intervening. They've done it before. Why do they, why are they doing it again? Okay. Um, so there are many historical instances. And let me talk about a few of these. There are, they come from the federal executive suite, from key personal advisors to the president, from Congress and from inside those at the top of the hierarchy, which we call um, palace politics. And there are a couple of individuals in the palace politics realm um, through history that have really changed the culture of the military. And then there's um, also some from the very top of the system out of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So beginning in 1776, the Continental Congress legislated pensions, disability, medical, and domicile for Revolutionary War soldiers, forever changing their livability status. There's an enactment of President Abraham Lincoln's general pension law system insured, which, which insured pensions were available for veterans into the end of the 20th century, also a changing livability status issue. In the 1940s, Eleanor Roosevelt, which I consider in the palace politics realm, considered the eyes and ears for the president, served as a personal advocate and catalyst for ensuring women could serve in the military. Total cultural shift. This changed forever the roles women were able to play in service in their country. And then President Truman required the leaders of the army to give permanent status to their female personnel through Executive Order 9981, which desegregated the military. From internal to the military, that's another really fascinating realm to, to know a little bit about when you're teaching this um, cultural change in the military, is Admiral Elmo Zumwalt Jr.'s Z-grams, 116, 48, 68, and 114, to improve the lives of sailors. And these naval messages were sent directly to the fleet. And he established a task force to review laws and policies and regulations that were inequitable and barred minorities from opportunities of promotion and retention. He looked at um, evolution of people programs and equal opportunity. So I, I have five minutes left, so I'm going to zip through this. These are imperative videos to have. You absolutely need to have Senator Martha McSally, who was preyed upon and raped by a superior officer. It's from inside the Congress, and it links to the military itself. The other one that I think is really imperative today is to have um, at least one, I don't want that to play, one short video on Senator Gillibrand's um, discussions about, about these roles. 
there's a third person, and this is my last comment, there's a third person that a lot of people don't know about, but his tie is, is really essential to the uh, concern, issues now too. Colonel Don Christensen, he's USAF retired, opened up a, a nonprofit and he was a counsel and military judge for sexual harassment and assault for 23 years. And so he has become so concerned by the chronic uh, problems with this that he's opened up a um, nonprofit and he deals with Congress. So we got the military Congress um, di dyad there. My final sentence. So history has shown that it takes military leaders, military leaders, civilian government actors and the public at large to instigate cultural change in the military. Sexual harassment and assault belong in a national security sector educational program and the Justice Improvement Act will change the culture of the military responsibility. And it is the most staggering reach into the military structure that has occurred in modern history. So at the back of this, um, I open it now to questions. In the back of the slide um, program, there are a slew of documents that you can look at, magazines, uh, videos, and so on, if you're interested. Oh, I'm sorry. Are we good? <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. Thank you. Um, this is such a complex subject, and we have about 10, 10 or so minutes to uh, have some questions and comments from the audience. I would just like to kick it off with a general question that I don't, you don't need to answer, but I will throw out for everyone, which is when you're in the process of implementing these things into curriculum, joint professional military education or otherwise, uh, and you have these active debates going on in Congress and elsewhere, how, uh, what, what is the record of not being always behind what the reality is generationally, uh, conceptually, et cetera? And I throw that out, I guess, as a general question. You can answer it if we have time, but I think... In general, that's something we, we face, I think, cr across all agencies. Right. Well, I can I can only speak for the department. And I, I honestly believe they do an incredible job um, in this area because for a couple of reasons. Um, they continually hire fresh talent, um, which keeps us really current. Um, and then those of us like me that have been around a while are voracious readers and we're always tying in because it's what we're teaching. We kind of know what's going on down in D.C. You, you have to to be productive in class. Um, so at least in this instance, I think it, it, um, the system itself keeps it um, current. Okay. Questions from the audience and comments. Please uh, raise your hand and... Dave Stone from Strategy and Policy Department. Um, so I, I had a question. Um, if you could specify a little more ways in which you can teach culture in that I get it's easy to find legislation and have students read about legislation. It's harder to find readings on culture and get students to talk about culture. What sorts of suggestions do you have for doing that? Thanks. So what I can do, please email me uh, because I did a... Um, search before I created this because I thought those questions might come up and I'll send you my list if that's okay. All right, good. I have a question regarding um, other partner nation contexts. So from like a security cooperation standpoint, are there any resources that you've come across that you think would be especially applicable in um helping our partners to maybe bypass some of the challenges we had in establishing their own structures or policies? Okay, let me make sure I understand. Um, information on bypassing gender issues in other cultures? More so um, things that resources that you've come across that you think would help us in interacting with partner nations and essentially establishing their own sexual assault and harassment prevention and response programs or training um, mm -hmm. that could kind of um, encapsulate what we've learned as a military and so that they can leapfrog over potentially some of the challenges that we've had 
um, in implementing their own. Right. So I think the person you actually need to get in touch with is Dr. Yamin. Um, because I see, first of all, I see her shaking her head and I'm out of this now for about three years, but yes, I used to know a whole slew of, or list of items. Um, so Dr. Yamin, can I encourage her to set? Okay, good. All right. I don't mean, I don't like passing the buck. <laughs> I think I'm too dated. Um, I'm going to add just one quick note to that because Dr. Ron brings, brings up a, a an important point, and your question is so pertinent, and that is that uh, I think one of the more important things that Americans are discovering when we're interacting with our partners and allies is that some of those partners and allies are ahead of us in this regard, and they have implemented uh, right down to the foundation things that we haven't yet done, whether it's because our institutions are larger or whether it's because uh, there's, you know, more more interaction across uh, between government and, and military, but but there are definitely examples and data. Uh, I think someone mentioned this morning the Israeli forces, they seem to survey everything and for a long time have had data on this. And there are many other nations as well uh, in my not extensive knowledge about it. My, <laughs> I think we have definitely time for at least one more question. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Montgomery McFaight. I am on the faculty in the Center for Naval Warfare Studies and Analysis, which for those of you who don't know, is right across the air bridge. Um, so I was just looking at the statistics on organizational cultural change. And uh, the Harvard Business Review, I don't know if you trust them as a source or not, but if you do, uh, their statistics are that you have to have 40% of the employees in an organization buying into a change for any change to occur. And you have to have 73% of the management. And I think the way you do that, the only way you can do that is not by teaching cultural change in some sense, but actually by hiring women. And to me, that's the heart of it. And I think at the War College, just to speak truth to power, we have been very successful at hiring women, recruiting women, but we have not been successful at retaining them. So I think we need to look at our own systems and processes in order to bring about the change that Dr. Ram is talking about. So Dr. McFate, for those of you that don't know, is a phenomenal brain and <laughs> cultural expert. So I think that's really great information. Um, and I encourage you to, Monk, Dr. McFate, I'm not trying to put stuff on your desk, but she's really well worth chatting with if you're interested in, in locating some cultural materials. Thanks a lot. We have room for one more question and we're a little ahead of time. So that's very good because we'll, we'll go ahead and uh, put that time into your presentations. Yes, please. So I have a comment rather than a question. So um, just in terms of lessons learned from other forces, I think it would be interesting to look at the um, Australian force. Um, for example, the Israeli force doesn't incorporate women into all tasks. So I think we need to look at it from total integration perspective. And I think it is with only total integration that females get respect within the forces. And that's a start. Thank you. If others uh, have questions as we move on, then I would encourage anyone to ask questions towards the end that pertain to any of the presentations. But we have uh, sufficient time now. We're going to move on. And uh, I believe, uh, Professor Bell, you are up. And please, you have the floor. Great. Thank you. Um, admirals, uh, deans, faculty, students, thank you so much for spending your time here today. 
Um, it's really my honor to represent the entire Maritime Security and Governance Staff Course team. Uh, this is a small but very hardworking and mission-driven team over in our International Programs Department. I'm also happy to talk to a room of friendly faces. I see many people who've been generous with their time as I've come around to ask for advice and, and sometimes harass for advice in building a new curriculum. Um, and, and I hope that you can take some pride and, and see your contributions reflected in some of what I'll present today. Um, we're also a new class, so I suspect that many people in the room are not familiar with the Maritime Security and Governance Staff Course, or MSGSC. So I'd like to use that time to first introduce the course and then talk about the ways that we've been able to experiment with integrating women, peace, and security into our new curriculum. Uh, and I, I hope that's instructive for everyone. So for those unfamiliar with the course, uh, our team has been charged with something that is pretty exceptional here at the Naval War College. Because while most of the college's curriculum is designed around the needs of American officers and focused on joint war fighting, we've developed a brand new curriculum that is tailored for the most pressing maritime security interests of our international partners and allies. So we believe that by building international capacity and applying staff course components, to primary partner naval missions like IUU fishing and human trafficking at sea. We're strengthening international relationships and reinforcing our shared global commitment to a free and open global ocean. Uh, I think this is a critical function in a time when the world is being challenged by revisionist powers that are looking to undermine that vision of, of a free and open ocean. Uh, this year, which is our first year fully operational following a beta test in 2022, we expect 52 mid-grade Naval and Coast Guard officers from 43 different nations. And that puts us at about the same size in terms of student throughput as the Naval Command College and the Naval Staff College for comparison. Here we go. So our new course spans 21 weeks and includes about 500 student contact hours, which is comparable to what our students in the 10 month program and many master's degree programs receive. Due to the diversity of Naval and Coast Guard services and mission sets around the world, our course covers a combination of US Navy and Coast Guard functions, ranging from Marine safety and port security through maritime terrorism, piracy, and counter-trafficking uh, counter operations. One of our faculty members likes to say we do maritime peacetime or stabilization operations. Another likes to say we do everything on the spectrum uh, to the left of bang. And I kind of like that version. So building a new curriculum with a small team is a daunting task. It's sometimes a stressful task, but we also really treasure this opportunity to tinker and experiment with curriculum design and assessment in ways that would be very difficult for a larger program with a more established long-standing curriculum. Um, we've embraced this opportunity. We appreciate that we get to iterate at a faster clip because it's a short course. And I think we've built a decent understanding of what works over a pretty short period of time. We also know that we have a lot of work to do and I'm constantly seeking meetings so I can understand the best practices that you all have learned from other parts of the college. So expect me to come knocking if you haven't seen me before as we continue to refine the class. Um, we've been able to embrace our transition to outcomes-based military education from the very beginning of our course design. So our program is built around the same joint learning areas that are required by the Joint Chiefs of any JPME-1 course. We've really tried to make our class a laboratory for building primary learning outcomes assessing through direct and indirect methods, and driving the class through culminating capstone exercises and assignments. I understand that many of these transitions are underway across PME institutions and in other programs here at the college, and I expect that's why Dr. Yamin graciously offered us to come and share our experiences since we are experimenting with this as well. So our class is built on the same typical foundations of lectures and seminars, 
But given the diverse international student body, we've also been able to integrate a lot of opportunities for students to climb to higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy within our curriculum. At nine different times throughout our course, students are asked to critically apply course themes and assess their own national approaches to problems through student questionnaires. You see those pictured here. They brief their classmates on some aspect of their maritime threat environment or their maritime or military culture four times in these 21 weeks. And all of this reflection culminates in a three-week workshop at the end of the course in which each student must draft a national maritime security strategy and then defend that strategy before a panel of their peers, uh, the faculty, and distinguished guests, including our CNO International Fellows. Thank you for being here today. And uh, last year, our WPS Chair, Dr. Yamin, as well. We also know that at least one student has already presented this draft strategy uh, to high-ranking officials in their Ministry of Defense. So we're very happy with that. Uh, finally, our time with the class has allowed us to include about 100 hours of tabletop exercise in a fictitious world that we've created. So these experiential learning activities, which I will call TTXs from here on out, occur in afternoons across 12 weeks of our curriculum to reinforce our course messages. Uh, over our course, students will respond to oil spills, the war game responses to gray zone aggression from a neighboring country's fishing fleet, They'll organize a multinational task force to enforce UN sanctions and counter maritime weapons trafficking and other functions. Here's some photos from the classroom to show you what a typical afternoon might look like in MSGSC. So when we get students' attention for this long, we, we have the pleasure of having them full time, five days a week, for as long as we want them. There are many, many ways we might consider promoting the women, peace, and security agenda. This has been the topic of many debates within our team, and I think it's fair to say that we've had a little fun experimenting with how to best drive critical thinking and assess learning about WPS uh, through outcomes-based education. So now that I've given you a basic understanding of our course, I want to spend the rest of my time talking about what our experimentation has taught us about bringing WPS into our classroom. The most important question for us is always, did we do a good job? Do we have any confidence that our group of officers is going home more likely to use gendered perspectives in their work than they were when they got here? We know that we can guarantee that we can expose students to these ideas, but how do we increase the chances that a gendered perspective becomes a part of their decision-making toolkit over the long term? Here's our class from 2022. I'm happy to share that our class from 2023, both classes actually, have women enrolled. So what did we do in 2022? We took an aggressive but pretty conventional approach. We invited guest lecturers uh, at the beginning and at the end of our course. We gave each of our guest lecturers about an hour to talk to students about the importance of using a gendered perspective. We also invited a virtual speaker from Bangladesh to give a great case study on the importance of considering gender when responding to a maritime crisis like Rohingya migration in the Bay of Bengal. Um, we gave explicit instruction to our students to consider gender and the tabletop exercise focused on irregular migration. We surveyed our students extensively and they told us we did a good job. They found the lectures to be informative and beneficial. They learned things. If we wanted to congratulate ourselves on a job well done, there's lots of evidence for us to do so uh, with a great deal of confidence. But something happened at the end of our course that surprised us a bit. We did not give students explicit instruction to write gender into their maritime security strategies because we thought this is one way, this is an outcome that we can measure. How many will do this after three to five hours of WPS instruction? when not explicitly told that they must. And we found that most of them didn't. So in the summer of 22, that made us wonder, what can we do differently? What can we learn? We went back to the drawing board. So here's a hypothesis about what happened. First, plenty of research points to the strong effects of self-serving biases, like fundamental attribution error. And these biases might cause us to think 
that we do a pretty good job of considering gender as individuals. And that might lead students to the conclusion that WPS is included in the curriculum, mostly because others need to hear the, uh, the message or because this is a mandatory requirement that is on the outskirts of, of the core learning objectives. Well, this led us to think, well, if these things are true, then just like an implicit bias test that's meant to uncover uh, subconscious bias is used at the beginning of a corporate DEI training to reframe a conversation and reveal hidden biases, maybe we can soften students' initial positions and make them receptive to this mission by showing them that gender is something that they could have considered but chose not to, rather than telling them that this is something that they could consider sometimes. We think a lecturer is in a much stronger position if they come into a room where the audience could have used a gendered lens to approach a problem, but already didn't do so. It gives us a concrete example and it levels the playing field so that we have an illustration of room for growth. So this student experience of overlooking gender, if we can create that at the beginning, it may, and this is only a hypothesis to be tested, it may create a greater possibility that later messages about the importance of using gendered analysis and incorporating WPS perspectives uh, will be internalized by the students. Okay, so what are we doing with the 2023 class? We tried something very different. Instead of exposing the students to the issue through guest speakers, instead we first introduced students to WPS through a tabletop exercise that was superficially about showing students the seven steps of the military decision-making process. We did not tell students to consider gender as they worked through this tabletop exercise, but in a maritime human smuggling scenario, we provided adequate background material on gender and how that affects smuggled and trafficked persons and the disparate treatment of men, women, girls, and boys by the perpetrators. I should mention, Jeff, say hi to everybody. There's, there's Jeff. Jeff did a great job of, of leaving lots of threads that we think good planning staff officers should have pulled to really explore. But we left the students to do it. Do you think they did it? No, no. But that's what we wanted. We didn't want the students to do it. That's what we expected. Because what that did is it created an opportunity for us in the debrief to say, how might this have been different if you had considered gendered aspects of this? Instead of providing them with a lecture and students thinking that maybe, yeah, we would have considered this in the scenario, we think about this in our service. We can ask them in a debrief and in a positive and constructive way, but how might gender affect concepts in search and rescue operations and responses to migration, like refoulement, places of safety, asylum. So it created an opportunity that wouldn't have existed if we'd led with lectures. So as we near the end of our course this year, we are thinking about how much we want to lead with WPS as we go into the migration exercise, or if we want to leave this as another opportunity for reflection. I think we were pretty happy with how this happened last time. And we're also considering whether we want to now require this in the maritime security strategy capstone. Okay, so what's next? Um, I wanna end on a point that might be a little bit provocative here. Courses like ours are meant to educate and instill critical thinking. That is JLA number one. Uh, we want officers to think about these issues when they go home, but a large part of a course like ours is also showing students from around the world the applicability of a military planning process so that they can go home and be effective staff officers. I think a problem we have is that we run into what I call a buzzsaw of doctrine because on this specific topic, it's difficult to pair the messaging with best practices in military planning that can be found in our doctrine and in our planning resources. So when we teach risk analysis, we can provide examples and then follow that up by pointing students to the joint risk analysis methodology. And when we teach brainstorming uh, and design thinking, we can point them toward the army design methodology. But while we preach a gendered lens and teach mission analysis, our core documents like JP5, the Navy planning process, 
uh, any of the several workbooks that are used around the college to teach students mission analysis tools. Uh, they don't explicitly mention women and gender, or at least I have not seen it. So what we're doing next, our next step is to try to develop some simple heuristics so that our students can come up with a gender estimate as part of their mission analysis process in the next version of our course. So I, I say this with humility, we are still learning. That's only a hypothesis, um, but I think this is low hanging fruit that we'd be foolish not to reach out and seize. With that, thank you for your time. And I'll welcome any questions in the Q&A. I have a question. I have a question. Oh, actually, um, uh, I will preface it by saying that uh, at one time, many years ago, I was very involved in uh, bringing women into combatant roles uh, in the Navy that they did not previously have. So I, I understand some of the issues. But what my question is, is what are those gender differences in thinking in this model, because I think of Margaret Thatcher and the Falklands War, and I'm not so sure she made decisions based on gender that would have been different than another prime minister. I think of Madeleine Albright's advocacy in Serbian War. I have seen decisions that were somehow gendered. So someone needs to explain to me what the difference are at this level, at the defense planning process or in decisions to go to war, decisions not to go to war, or how the war is operating. Thanks. Thank you very much for the question. Um, I, I think that there are several examples I can give here, especially in this area of the spectrum of operations left of bank and short of conflict. Uh, men are often the face of the global fishery sector and IUU fishing because they are primarily the ones out on the boat. But on the shore side of fishing, it's primarily women working as fishmongers, as processors, selling at markets. So thinking about how uh, a fisheries enforcement policy is likely to have effects on shore, I think is an important part of the COA development process. Um, I gave the example of migration, where a decision of what to do with migrants in distress uh, has profound implications for the women and men. Uh, we can envision scenarios pretty easily where something might qualify, a place might qualify as a place of safety where migrants can be disembarked if they're men, but maybe not if they're women or girls based on a human rights record and women's rights in that country. Um, I think in the COA analysis stage of thinking about actions, reactions, and counteractions, there's great value in thinking about how women might react. And if we're not talking military to military, if there's no enemy course of action, but instead we're anticipating reactions from a civilian population that's trying to be helped in an HADR situation or in a migrant uh, operation, uh, th those would be some examples, sir, where I think using a gendered approach to think separately about men and women can be very useful. And the academic literature on gender analysis provides some great and simple heuristics for doing this. Thanks. Other questions or comments? Press the button. Okay, okay is that good? Hi, I'm new. <laughs> That's why I don't know how to operate this. I just want to offer another example. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, so I'm Joe Steve. I'm an uh, assistant professor at NSA. The example I want to give is the gender dynamics of the Bush administration, right? I mean, uh, Condi Rice was bullied out of the interagency process by two hypermasculine advisors, right? Cheney and Rumsfeld. I don't think you can understand the internal dynamics of that or many administrations without looking at, at gender. Uh, but my question was more about teaching, and I, I'd love to hear anyone's thoughts on this. It's, you know, in, in NSA, we have usually one, maybe two women students per class. And I've heard the idea floated about having some classes have a more concentrated set of women. So maybe five out of 12 or 13 students and then having some classes with zero. Uh, and I'm curious as to what you all think might, the trade-offs and benefits might be of 
uh, for lack of a better word, distributing women students in a different way? I don't know that I'm the best to answer that question because we uh, have one section at a time. So we don't have any discretion over how to distribute students. Um, I, I think having uh, women in the classroom is important. As instructors, we have little to no control over that. But of course, um, bringing in guest speakers, offering a lot of perspectives that are more representative than our student body might be, is one thing that is in our control. And we do strive to do that. But I don't know if anybody else wants to take that. I will just offer my my comments that I think the distribution of women in the class is a, a good choice, just like the distribution of services. The more perspectives you get in the classroom, the better. If you were to pool everyone together who's like, imagine a class of all Army officers or all Marines or all women, it, you would just not get the luxury of shared perspectives. Can I follow up on that? I'm, I, I've had this conversation with a few people in my department, and I, I understand those points completely. I think I'm, I'm kind of wondering, though, like, who gets the benefit there, the male students or the female students of, of multiple perspectives? Because it seems like sometimes it's the, the female student being in there to provide the benefit for the men of those perspectives, whereas a, a good teacher should be able to help provide those perspectives no matter what. Um, I would I would just uh, say that from the perspective of someone who has kind of watched this over the years, 20 as of this year, the, I, you know, I think that would be something that you could survey, maybe. You could you probably ask students, how do you think this is working out? But when you do that, you're also introducing other problems into the classroom that may or may not actually be there. We may be identifying gender as a problem, but we can't be sure without asking that every person in that classroom is hyper fixated on gender. And so it can have, I think, a, a the opposite effect of what WPS is intended to do and what I think DEI is intended to do, which is to hyper focus on something that maybe wasn't a problem in the first place which is not to say that it's not noticeable because it certainly most certainly is noticeable from administrative processes all the way up to the people that are conducting uh you know moderating teams when you when you notice on your on your um, roster that they've taken the small percentage of women and distributed them across evenly so i think it introduces as many problems as it solves uh, in some cases uh, moreover, when you have equity and also, you know, it's sort of related maybe to WPS, but I think a little bit more to process and in, in DEI uh, to, for example, dictate that women should be more involved in committee work when you have X number of committees across the college. And you might not have experienced this yet, but you might, you will. Uh, if you have a lower percentage of faculty that can sit on those committees, then you have also a burden that falls on female faculty to be on lots of committees. That can be very good, but it can also create a disparity in workload. And again, the what the, bene, the, the net benefit or, uh, or detriment to careers is, unless you track it, you don't know. It's anecdotal. So I think this is what I think this panel is doing uh, wonderfully, and I'm going to let uh, Professor Stokes really bring us home, is to raise the problematics that exist in actually implementation phase. This is the hardest part. This is the part that will eat up, you know, lots of DOD dollars, but it is a part that should be very, uh, it should be edifying to everyone and hopefully result in something better as we go. With that, Professor Stokes, please uh, we'll look forward. Good afternoon, everyone. I echo uh, Curtis's comments. Um, I'm really delighted to speak in front of the faculty and hopefully my perspective will offer some ideas about integration of WPS into the curriculum for your own 
uh, your own work and your own uh, colleges or here in your own departments. My name is Professor Jane Stokes. I am a professor over at the Joint Maritime Operations, part of the College of Distance Education. A little bit about what I do. I'm a co-teacher for the Fleet Seminar Program. Fleet Seminar Program is your distance education version of the residence program. So I, my course, uh, JMO, similar to the residence side, there's three core courses. Our students go through two-year program to obtain a master's degree, vice the resident program, which is a 10-month program. Essentially, uh, very similar to the resident program, except spread out uh, once a week where we have a seminar full of students, usually um, mid-grade officers, civilians, uh, mostly naval officers, Marines, Coast Guard, a lot of civilians from different uh, capacities who largely are great influences, um, you know, across across the Navy, but really across the whole spectrum. The cool thing about it is uh, the College of Distance Education at any particular time has approximately 2,000 uh, enrolled officers uh, through it or enrollees, which really lends itself to have an incredible impact on uh, the Navy itself, right? Influencing that many officers is important. So uh, our our, our uh, college has a lot of um, naval influence at this level. Uh, so the reason why that's important is because uh, with one of the goals of the DOD in WPS implement, implementation at the service level is PME integration. And that's what we sought to do. And so I'm just offering my perspective of how we were successful in implementing and putting WPS material into our curriculum. And as I said before, hopefully that aids in anyone's uh, attempt or interest in, in doing that as well. Um, I believe that the ultimate importance is that this influence of getting these, these relatively young officers out there is going to enable them then to lead to the success in the um, lower levels of providing training to personnel and educating the force and really any touch points that these, these officers have with really having them understand and integrate and operationalize WPS at, at all levels. And this is critical for our, I believe, our strategy and what we seek to do. Uh, after all, uh, if we believe that WPS really aids in war fighting, then these officers are the ones who are going to operationalize this and the inclusion of women in operations at this level helps aid us as Americans in being successful in war or any operations related to war fighting. So with that, I just wanted to highlight some of the things Dr. Yamin talked about this morning and um, many of you may not have been there for, but uh, part of that WPS implementation is that inclusion of material into uh, PME. And with that, just like, you know, all things we do at this college, everything is nested. And so at the War Naval War College, uh, the, uh, the leadership has taken the uh, DOD uh, strategic framework and implementation plan and operationalized it so that it's inclusive in the strategy of the college too. And also the Secretary of the Navy in February of uh, 2022 had also provided a memo directing that WPS be maintained across PME. So we have this direct linkage of nested strategies to uh, include WPS material into the PME curriculum across the college. Part of the, the college's uh, uh, lines of effort include these four pillars. I'm only going to talk about the first one, which is that education pillar. Um, there's many ways, the symposium being one, that the college is implementing the, the WPS program. And the one I'm concerned with in my discussion is the PME integration and how that works. And so that's that first pillar right there. More specifically, this line of education in uh, effort, or rather the line of effort in education is integration into curriculum. So having the syllabus incorporate WPS as a core topic, cross-cutting themes, connecting different areas of study, focused readings, uh, seminar discussions, case studies, all related to WPS. 
are is kind of what we started looking at when we looked at integrating um, the WPS into the curriculum. I know this is a very busy slide. Uh, the intent of this is to show what we did on a department level in order to start thinking about how we were going to put WPS material into it. So probably a lot of you use this process. This is the JPME process of uh, how many, many folks integrate uh, any kind of topic into the, the curriculum. So you've got your op map, your officer, um, your officer professional military education program that dictates what must, what an officer must learn, right? That's our, our kind of Bible for JPME. And of that comes two primary things, your joint learning areas, and then your desired leader attributes, right? What does, what does a officer look like? What should they know? Those are mandatory things that need to go into that curriculum development. And then from that comes your program uh, learning objectives, um, which we're all familiar with, which the college generates. And that pulls from that, that Joint Chiefs of Staff information and that J7 information and says, okay, now let's take a look at the college level and see what we want to do. And that's updated yearly. And that includes, um, you know, competition continuum themed about um, future and contemporary operational environments, organizational ethical concepts, and uh, theory doctrine. So what you would expect comes from a PME Institute with, with military officers, right? And then individually, that development of the course learning objectives, particularly for us, the JMO course learning objectives includes that critical thinking and uh, naval theory, operational art, um, concepts you may or may not have heard if you've taken our courses, and then those maritime operations and communication. Um, and then finally, that develops our curriculum and then our, our syllabus. So as you can see from that kind of busy chart, there's a lot that we have to throw into that development. There's not a lot of room for adding things. To make it more complicated, then we've got the J7 information, which pulls the um, what we call the special areas of emphasis. So last year, one of the special areas of emphasis was the competition continuum, right? And, and several other things. This year was deterrence in the 21st century, data analytics, artificial intelligence, and global force management. All the PME institutes come together and they decide collectively, you know, what are those themes that we want to emphasize that year? And that gets included too. So how do you fit WPS when there's so much already there that it's very hard to move um, and have any wiggle room with creating anything? Uh, we had, fortunately, at JMO, my, my co-teacher and I, uh, Professor Adrian Schutke, we had an opportunity to move our curriculum around a little bit because we were revising and updating it. Um, so with that, we looked at how could we take our entire uh, curriculum and and make it more of a building block approach. And so in tandem with a resident uh, JMO, we looked at how can we make this uh, more streamlined so it makes better sense for the students. So we, we revised the whole curriculum. And one way we did that is by that, like I said, that building block approach, first looking at the theory, uh, naval theory, taking, taking our students through the beginning stages of World War II as a, um, a case study approach, going back to the beginning parts of that Pacific campaign and driving through some of the operations to then lead us to that joint operational warfare theory. And then block three, which is our contemporary operations, which is on the con competition continuum. I'm gonna pause there because that's where we really had an opportunity to include uh, WPS into it. and. Um, what we had looked at is the competition continuum really involved exactly what WPS is about, which is that, that you know, uh, competition short of war before and after, but also inc including warfare too, right? How do we, how do we understand warfare um, and continue to do those operations even if we're not exactly in war, right? And so a lot of that is that security, how do we maintain security? How do we do, you know, everything short of war? How do we prevent war? And so we nested the WPS strategy as a reading into our block block three, 
there and had our students read it. And we had questions that we generated in a seminar discussion. And we also put that in context with our section on state stability and fragility. So we were discussing how uh, and what makes a failed state, what makes a fragile state, but also what makes a stable state. And in that discussion, we discussed how um, women's uh, women's perspectives and inclusion in operations might or might not have an effect using real world examples of failed and fragile states such as Yemen or Somalia, um, which drove some very interesting discussions. I think that uh, what we had learned from doing it the first time and the feedback we got from our uh, adjunct professors. Uh, one thing I failed to mention is we don't just teach here at Newport. We have 50 other professors, um, JMO professors who teach throughout the country. And that's how we teach so many students is there's um, seminars throughout the country. So we got feedback from our adjunct professors too that um, gave us knowledge about how that was received by students. And you know, it, some of the challenges and the feedback we received wasn't all positive was a lot of the students didn't feel as though we had um, gone in enough depth. They didn't really understand some of the strategy. It was too abstract. Um, as, as we all know, as educators here, uh, there's not a lot of stickiness in knowledge when you uh, are just kind of explaining concepts to them that are abstract. The real tool to gaining knowledge and it being kind of sticky knowledge is more through case studies and stories and all that. And so. What we plan to do next year is to put case studies in there and um, guide the students through activities that aren't specifically only directed at WPS, but have WPS elements in them as well. And also to gain more materials such as uh, articles or real life scenarios that incorporate WPS and then guide our students through discussions, which will liven it, but not solely focused on WPS. The, the other nice thing about our nested approach to our our syllabus too is that what we have found with the students is they pull concepts from earlier sections and continue to drive them through the whole um the whole curriculum and so that allows us to revisit those themes throughout our course so maybe we have naval theory at the beginning but later on we're touching upon some of those concepts we learned earlier and our students too have pulled some of the things they've learned from WPS and have pulled them through where now we're teaching block five and doing an exercise. They're able to provide examples of where women's inclusion into, uh, into operations might lead to success with the, um, the sort of battle plans that they're creating with their scenario. So that's our, that's my thought with how uh, our integration was so far initially successful, but can go deeper too. I would offer that um, by way of feedback also incorporating WPS on a strategic level. Um, I would envision if we raised it up, um, I could, I would look at the way that, for example, the interwar years, women had an impact during World War II on uh, creating a strategic space for men to, to go into to warfare. What did that do for the face of warfare? Or then on the tactical side, having articles about um, gender advisors who are on the ground and their success in their operations that they do might be kind of an interesting article to pull for more tactical guided courses. There's a, a lot of information out there. Uh, however, I feel there's not enough material. And um, I, I would love to have more case studies and more articles that we could throw at the students to really guide them through that aren't singularly focused on WPS, but incorporate those real world scenarios that help further the students' understanding of how to implement and incorporate um, WPS themes through, through the coursework. Uh, that is my presentation. That's all I have. Thank you.